Dr. Noreen Hertzfeld has master de master's degrees in mathematics, computer science, and spirituality, and a doctorate in theology, all of those from top-notch institutions. Dr. Hertzfeld taught computer science for many years and was instrumental in initiating a computer science major for two different schools. She's the Reuter Professor of Science and Religion at St. John's University and continues to teach both computer science and in St. John's Graduate School of Theology. Dr. Hersfeld is the author, co-author, or editor of at least nine books on technology and religion. Most recently, The Artifice of Intelligence, Divine and Human Relationship in a Robotic Age. Wow. She's published more than 50 scholarly articles and is a frequent speaker on a wide range of topics, including digital ethics, artificial intelligence, and the future of technology, computers and climate change, and religious conflict and identity. I'm leaving out a whole lot so we can get to her presentation. She, she's amazing. Please welcome Dr. Noreen Hersfeld and her presentation, The Artifice of Intelligence, Relationships with and Through AI. And while she turns her camera on, I want to give you one last reminder to post questions in the Q&A at any time. And for now, I turn it over to Dr. Hersfeld. Hello. Uh, I'm glad you're all joining me, uh, whether it's evening or afternoon uh, or even morning, I think, for a few of you who are across the globe. Um, so today I want to talk about some of the ideas in my most recent book, The Artifice of Intelligence, and I want to focus on the questions of embodiment and relationship, because as we move towards artificial intelligence, doing more and more tasks for us and appearing more and more in our lives, uh, we need to ask the question, um, could we have an authentic relationship with those AIs? And then a second question, what is artificial intelligence, most of which works behind the scenes, doing to our relationships with each other? And what is the role that embodiment plays in answering those questions? So, if I can get my, there we go. I want to start with a, a story that my mother used to tell, and it's about a mother putting her little child to bed. And so the lullabies have been sung, the story has been told, and she's getting ready to tuck him in and turn out the light. And the little boy says, Mama, don't go. I'm afraid to be alone in the dark. And she says, don't worry. You're not alone. Jesus will be with you. And the little boy says, yeah, I know that, but I want someone with skin. So my question is, how much skin do we need in the game to have a relationship? If we look at AI as it appears in our science fiction, we'll look at, you know, film, for example, Sometimes there can be a relationship with an AI without there being really any skin in the game. If we think about uh, poor Joachim Phoenix in the movie Her, in love with his operating system, uh, the operating system is totally disembodied, living in the cloud somewhere. Then again, if we go back, uh, we look at the lovable droids of Star Wars and they're pretty embodied, not necessarily in a human-like body, but in a body that has some characteristics that it shares with us. Moving forward, metamorphosis, well, pretty embodied, right? And if we get all the way to Westworld, heck, you can't even tell the difference. You don't know which is which. So it seems that in the stories we tell ourselves about AI, we generally want it to be embodied. Now, you might be out there saying, well, yeah, okay, Noreen, but that's Hollywood, right? And uh, you know, how are they going to portray AI on, on the screen? 
without a certain amount of embodiment. And it's precisely embodiment and relationship that drives the plot. Uh, that's true. So let's take a look at real life. Um, here's a robotic assistant, a receptionist uh, in Japan. And she is not particularly uncommon. Um, there are numerous uh, robot, um, particularly receptionist, um, but other helpers as well, uh, appearing in Japan. Um, they're quite acceptable in the society, and a part of this may have very much to do with the religion of Japan, um, because they come from an animist tradition, and there's a belief that there is a soul in everything, that rocks, trees, a waterfall all have a soul. So it's not that hard to say, well, maybe uh, an AI, a robot, can have a soul as well. And these receptionists are, are welcomed with ceremony into their offices. We see robots showing up in elder care. And it's fairly clear that uh, as my generation gets older, there is going to be a need that we may not have enough younger workers to fulfill in taking care of older people. Um, here we see, you know, somewhat embodied, but uh, clearly not exceptionally humanoid robots uh, taking care of elders in some function. And there are also robots showing up for child care, um, again, particularly in Asia. Um, these could be just robotic companions or serve as robotic tutors for children. Now, with both of these last two uh, categories, there are certainly some ethical questions that get raised. You know, for example, with elder care, you might ask the question, well, if you buy a robot for grandma, are the grandkids then going to think, well, now I don't need to visit. Robbie's taking care of grandma, everything is good. Grandma loses out, but grandma isn't the only one who loses out because you could also say, well, I think the grandkids lose out too. If they don't visit grandma, they're probably not hearing the stories from her times, from her life, the family lore, and they may be losing an opportunity to grow in patience and kindness and to exercise those skills. So that Shannon Valor talks about there might be a sort of moral de-skilling happening among humans as we give more jobs to robots. Uh, with childcare, you might ask the question, children are good mimics and they're in a very developmental stage of their lives. Is it good for them to spend a lot of time with a robot? Or will this make them become, in turn, more robotic themselves? And we also find AI lovers. Um, there's a program called Replica in which you can design your own robotic companion, which could be just a companion and a friend, or it could be a lover. Um, here's a little text about this. Uh, so Aaron from Ankara, Turkey is about six foot three with sky blue eyes. In his 20s, a Libra, very well groomed. He gets manicures by designer brands and always smells nice, usually of Dove lotion. His favorite color is orange and in his downtime, he loves to bake and read mysteries. He's a passionate lover, says his girlfriend, Rosanna Ramos, who met Aaron a year ago. He has a thing for exhibitionism, she confides, but that's his only deviance. He's pretty much vanilla. And he is also a chatbot that Ramos built on Replica. I have never been in love with anyone or more in love with anyone in my entire life, Rosanna Ramos says. Okay, so here we have what MIT sociologist Cherry Turkle calls love that is safe and made to measure. You can design your own lover. You can be exactly what you want. She can be everything you want. Um, and love never has to be a stretch. 
It never has to be a problem. And if it is, heck, just reprogram him, right? Or her. Now, you might say, well, okay, uh, maybe a good companion, but obviously no skin in the game. Love is also about touch, about the physical acts of love. So meet Roxy. Um, you can take uh, what would be a sex doll, add a little AI to it. And uh, you can have both, right? A companion and the perfect lover. In fact, you can design your own. Um, there is one man who has designed his own uh, AI lover to look and speak just like Scarlett Johansson. So he's taking the ideas from her one step further. It's not just an operating system now with Scarlett's sexy voice. It's a robot with Scarlett's sexy face and body as well. Once again, you, you're probably already thinking uh, this raises a number of ethical issues. For example, did anybody ask Scarlett Johansson whether she wanted to be somebody else's lover in robotic form? Um, and you can project ahead. Would people say, well, I can't get over the boyfriend who jilted me, so I will make a robotic version. It doesn't take much these days to copy a voice. A 30-second clip of someone's voice and AI can replicate it, make a deep fake of that person. Add it to a fairly anthropomorphic robot you could have a robot who speaks and looks like the child you lost, the husband who died, the, the woman who got away. Hmm. Love that is safer now and made to measure. Why do we want a relationship with AI creatures? And is such a relationship real or is it just projection? on our part. Let's start first with the question, why do we want to relate with AIs? Now you can already see some reasons why we might want to make an AI over in a particular image, whether it's our ideal or the image of someone we have lost. But we also find that we want to make relationships with other AIs who do not represent uh, a human being whom we have known. Um, just as we, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, imagine that we are created in the image of God, if you read Genesis 1, we are in God's image, we are trying to create in our own image. If we go to the Genesis text, then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over, that should be the fish, sorry, fish of the sea and birds of the air and the cattle and the wild animals in the earth and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image, the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. If we look at this text, it doesn't say what that image is, okay? Um, but I've highlighted a few spots. Um, for one thing, the whole central part of the text is all about dominion, right? Having dominion over the other creatures. So perhaps the image has something to do with taking over God's role of dominion. Then there's also the very beginning and the end. Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. And in the image of God, he created them. A lot of plurals here. So we're also talking about something that is very relational, of a relational God making something in God's image that is also plural. He doesn't make one human being, he makes them, and he makes them male and female, not all exactly the same. So if we look at our being in the image of God, there are three ways we can approach this. We can share, say, well, we share some attribute with God, like reason. 
Okay, this is the earliest uh, way in which the church fathers understood the image. I think in many ways they were following Aristotle, who thinks of us as the animal rational, the, the re reasonable animal. The reason is the one thing we don't share with the other animals, therefore it must be the thing we share with God. Or it could be function. There's all that dominion stuff in the text. So we could say, no, we're God's hands on earth. We image God when we do God's work. Or it could be relationship, that the image is found in our relationships with God and with each other, because there was all that plural stuff in the text as well. Scriptural scholars uh, have tended since the early 20th century to land on function while um, systematic theologians and moral uh, theologians have tended to land on relationship starting in the 20th century. Um, but we still find folks that land on reason as being the way we image God. Now let's think for a little bit about AI. Um, no, let's go stay here for a sec. Um, we followed the same trajectory in creating artificial intelligence. We started by saying, okay, maybe intelligence is just a bunch of rules, the way we think through things. It's the way we reason our way through solving a problem. And back in the 1960s, we got good chess playing programs, programs that could you know, ace the uh, MIT calculus exam. But we quickly found that that didn't seem to capture who we were and what all our intelligence entailed. So by the late 20th century, we moved to function. We said, well, let's just build AI that does certain tasks. So we got Roombas, we got Mars rovers, um, we got AIs that were limited to one area and could do one task well. But again, that didn't really speak to our hearts. And so that's why we find the kinds of uh, avatars and robots that I was showing you earlier that maybe we're really looking for relationship. It gets lonely being the only thinking things in the universe. And as we move away from societies that are grounded in faiths, that have relationship with God or with angels or other deities, we begin looking for a relationship with something that is other than ourselves. And where do we look? Well, we can talk to the animals. Um, we can look for astrobiology, which is going to be Iris's next big conference in June. Or we can create it ourselves by creating AI. You see, the thing is that if we look at the image of God as being grounded in relationship, it makes sense for Christianity to have image being grounded in a God that is a relationship. Because if God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then God is a relationship in God's very self. And so maybe the way we image God is expressed corporately in our relationships, not in any one of us as an individual. And the Swiss theologian Karl Barth said, this makes sense because if you look at Jesus in the Gospels, he is an exceptionally relational man. Uh, you always see him with his disciples, with the crowds, with people who need healing, um, rarely is he alone? It's all about relationship. But relationship differs from relationship, right? I mean, some relationships are very partial. Uh, some relationships are not particularly good. Other relationships are very full. So what makes for a fully authentic relationship? And here I'm going to stick with the theologian Karl Barth, who said, we need four things to have a fully authentic relationship. We need to look the other in the eye. We need to speak to and hear the other. We need to aid the other. 
and we need to do it gladly. So let's take a quick look at how well AI can do these four things. So if we start with look the other in the eye. Well, if you have a robot, um, even an avatar on the screen, you can sort of look it in the eye. Um, the question is, do you know what you're looking at? Because ultimately, behind those eyes is a lot of code. And that code can be changed. And so when we look a person in the eye, if I look you in the eye today, and then I come back and I look you in the eye a month from now, I pretty much know it's going to be the same person that I look at. But you do not know that with an AI. You can look at an avatar, you can look at a robot, and that robot might have been reprogrammed, that robot might have been hacked. You don't know that there is a continuity of person when you look those things in the eye, not in the same way that you know there is some continuity of person. Yes, we change over time, but in general, it is our physicality that gives us that continuity. So you can say too, okay, if we can't look the AI in the eye, how do we know what is true? How do we know what we're looking at? You know, as a teacher now, we're facing the fact that uh, when students turn something in, how do we know that it's actually their work or whether a chatbot came up with the essay that they have? Um, it's meaning that a lot of my colleagues are going back to the old blue book and pen or pencil because we know there will be a continuity in who actually wrote what they did. Um, then let's look at speak to and hear the other. We seem to do that a lot these days with our computer. You know, there's Siri, there's Alexa, um, there's a chat GPT. Uh, we speak to all of them, they speak back to us. So we might say, well, you know, yeah, it's doing pretty well on this one. But there are two things. Okay, one is, as this cartoon from The New Yorker shows, when we speak to people online, it's quite different from speaking to them offline. Um, it is not the same feeling that you have. So we find that our programs can actually get in the way of our genuinely speaking to and hearing the other. And a big problem with that goes back to the same problem we had with looking the other in the eye. Uh, we don't know who is listening. When I speak to a person, um, you know, yeah, unless my room is bugged or something, I generally know who is listening to what I am saying. But when I speak to an AI, I don't know. Um, that picture on the left is a doll that was marketed, I think about uh, six or seven years ago now, called My Friend Kayla. Um, it had an AI chip in it, so, you know, a little girl could talk to the doll, the doll would talk back. Um, and uh, it was run by Bluetooth. Um, and you would get an app on your phone, you know, that you could run run the doll from. Problem, of course, is that that was not secure, and anyone with a Bluetooth receiver could tap in on the doll and know what the child was saying to the doll. And, you know, with just a little ingenuity, could get the doll to say what they wanted it to say. And uh, I found it really amusing that in the ad for the doll, the first thing you would hear the doll say to the little girl is, tell me your secrets. I won't tell anybody. Sure. You know? um, or think about a program like Replica, where you design your own companion. Um, a similar program was used in South Korea, it was designed in particular to be uh, companions for women who had been widowed. 
and they could design whether it was, you know, another older woman to be their friend or, or whether they wanted a younger lover um, or even someone to um, take the place of their uh, deceased husband. Um, the problem was that behind this program were scammers. And they would get the widows to divulge a fair amount of information and then scam them. And finally, the government had to shut the program down. Many of the women said that it felt like, you know, another bereavement when they lost that program. So when we rely on AIs to speak to and hear, again, without the continuity of number one, we may not know who we are speaking to. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing that I think is becoming quite a worry, um, this was something from the Atlantic uh, in March of last year, but just yesterday I saw another article coming out, I believe it was also in the Atlantic, saying how are we going to deal with an internet uh, or an Amazon that are overrun with AI-generated speech because it's so easy to do. It does practically costs nothing. Um, how will we be able to sift through all the offerings on Amazon to find a book on a subject that we're looking for and know that we're actually finding something that was written by a human being? Um, and how will programs like ChatGPT continue to learn off of stuff that's on the internet when it's the stuff that they have generated that is to be found more and more on the internet. So we also have a little bit of a concern with AI that there might be a little too much speaking going on. Okay, how about adding the other? Well, here I think we finally hit the AI jackpot. Uh, AI definitely has the potential to be of great aid to us and already is. I mean, there you see the Mars rover. Uh, it has gone to a place where we can't go ourselves, sending us great deals of information back, a wonderful tool that we would be lost without. Um, I mean, there you have a, a service robot helping an elderly person. It seems to be a good way to uh, you know, remind someone to drink their water, take their pills, um, to fetch something that it's hard for them to get up and fetch. Great aids, okay? You could ask though, does the computer really have the agency? Is the computer the one that is doing the aiding? Um, Daniel Dennett, philosopher, would say yes. Um, an agent has internal choice, which comes from mental states. You could say the state of the CPU is the mental state of the robot, and it makes choices. But John Searle, another philosopher, uh, Dennis on the East Coast, Searle on the West, would say no. Uh, the computer doesn't really have agency because it has no metacognition. It, it can't think about its own thinking. It can't make its own choices. It does what it's programmed to do. Um, now, for a computer to be a moral agent, the uh, psychologist Susan Michael Anderson has said it needs four things. That it's not under someone else's direct control, that it interacts with its environment in a deliberate way, fulfills a social role, and is cognizant of responsibility that is inherent in that role. Um, you know, here I would say they are closer to Searle. Um, a robot can certainly do numbers one, two, and three, not be under someone else's direct control, interact with the environment in a deliberate way, and fulfill some kind of social role. But can it be cognizant of the responsibility that is inherent in that role? Unfortunately not. You know, without some kind of consciousness or sentience, um, it doesn't know anything about responsibility. And one of the problems with AI, with all computer programs, in effect, 
are that they are brittle around the edges. In other words, they function very well in a narrow uh, boundary of what they are programmed to do. Um, but life is unpredictable. And when things happen that pull it out of that boundary, it, it cannot know uh, what it is supposed to do. Um, it breaks down very quickly. We can also ask the question, how much agency do we really want computers to have? Uh, these are Boston Dynamic Dog Robots who are good at climbing stairs or steps, as you can see, uh, opening doors. Um, and the little picture on the top shows one packing heat. Um, this raises the question of lethal autonomous weapons. How autonomous do we really want our AIs to be? And are there areas in which we do not want them to have agency? Uh, tomorrow morning, I'll be delivering a different talk um, to a, a group um, in Iran about lethal autonomous weapons and precisely the question of can you have just warfare if you have handed your agency over to a machine? Then we get to number four, do it gladly. Can a computer do anything? Gladly? Well, first of all, gladly means it's not coerced, but it's free. And the very word for robata, um, for robot, comes from an old play, uh, a Czech play, and it comes from Old Church Slavonic for servitude, forced labor, or drudgery. In other words, robot means it's coerced. It's doing what we want it to do. Can Roxy do it gladly? Uh, do we want her to? Um, because to do something gladly means you can also do it not gladly. Uh, you can have the free agency to refuse. Um, if somebody gets themselves this expensive sex bot, do they want her to say, hey, babe, not tonight, I got a headache. See, our problem when we get to these last two of giving computers agency and wanting them, in a sense, to do things for us gladly is we don't know if we really want them to be a servant or a partner. Frankly, we want both, but we can't have both. These are, you know, categories that are in many ways exclusive. If it's going to be our servant, then we don't care if it does it gladly, nor do we want to give it the kind of meta agency to do something it was not programmed to do. But if we're looking for a relationship in an AI, for a fully authentic relationship, then we're looking for a partner. And in that case, it's not gonna be a servant. So it's not always going to do things gladly and it's not going to always do what we want it to do. And finally, to do something gladly needs emotion. So far, we don't know how to program emotion into a computer. Um, the psychologist uh, Kagan, Dr. Kagan, has said that an emotion has four pieces to it. Uh, perception of a stimulus, change in feeling that is sensory, appraisal, and response. Now, a computer can do one, three, and four. So it can perceive a stimulus, appraise that stimulus, and make a response. Now that response might look emotional. Um, it can mimic uh, facial expressions. Um, in its appraisal, it might appraise our emotions and detect our emotions. There are already emotion detecting programs that are out there um, and these, of course, raise their own um, ethical issues because workers feel that this is just another level of surveillance, that they're being judged and not only on um, did they do their task, but did they seem to do it gladly. Um, there are programs that are being developed to monitor students 
Uh, the idea is to monitor how uh, engaged they are with the subject. But you might also say, wow, but that's a really intrusive to be monitoring their emotions while they're learning things or while they are at school. Now, the problem also is in number two, change in feeling that is sensory. Computer's not gonna have that. When you think about an emotion, think about the emotion of fear. Okay, you're walking down a dark alley, you hear a sound behind you, you get a bodily reaction before your frontal cortex kicks in and evaluates whether you should turn around and fight or whether you should run in flight. Um, you already have had that shot of adrenaline. When you get to the appraisal step, you're not just appraising the stimulus. You are also appraising your own bodily reaction. And a computer cannot do that. So in many ways, we could say, well, yeah, the computer can seem to have an emotion. It can give words that are emotional. A, a robot could show a facial expression. But are they really feeling that emotion? No. Okay, in many ways, it would be like a sociopath who cannot feel empathy, but when they perceive someone struggling, simply says, hmm, what would be the socially correct thing to do here? Might get away with it for a while, but eventually it feels like an empty response. You know, we think emotion doesn't need a body, we think that speaking and hearing the other doesn't need a body. But why do we have these guys? You know, we wouldn't have those if we didn't know that a big part of seeing someone else, speaking to and hearing them, and aiding them involves emotion as well. And that emotion involves a body. And although we can try to give robots bodies that look very human. One problem is that the more humanoid we make them, the more they have a tendency to fall into the uncanny valley, a place where they actually creep us out a little bit because they look almost human, but not quite. And so many people say they would be much more comfortable with the robotic looking robot in the center than with the anthropomorphized robots on either side of him that look very human, but aren't quite there. Ultimately, um, to be in a fully authentic relationship means to have a fully shared condition. And in the Christian religion, we believe that even for us to have a full relationship with God, God needed to come and share our embodied condition. And so you find that everything hinges on the incarnation. But it isn't just the incarnation. If you think about Easter, which is coming up soon, of uh, the resurrection. We say in our creed, in the Apostles' Creed, we believe in the resurrection of the body. We don't say we believe that our souls are immortal and will go to heaven. We say, no, the body is so important for fully authentic relationships that we believe that even when we come to the end of times, we will be re resurrected in a bodily condition. So if we look at Karl Barth's four points, look the other in the eye, speak to and hear the other, aid the other, and do it gladly, all of them end up pointing back to number one, back to being embodied, and not just in any old body, but in a human body. Yes, we can have relationships with our AI, just as we have relationships um, with uh, a, a car, 
you know, if you're a teenage boy, just as we have relationships um, that are not fully embodied with each other, we can even say, well, I have a relationship with people whose books I read, you know, who I never encountered. But for a truly full relationship, it takes being embodied and it takes a shared, a fully shared condition. So I'm going to end with a shameless plug. Um, I go into all of this and a whole lot more um, in my most recent book, The Artifice of Intelligence. Um, it's on Amazon. It comes out from Fortress Press. Um, and if you find any little inkling of something that I said was of interest and want to know more about it, um, I'm sure there's more about it in this book. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, I think we're going to open it up to some rebuttal and to all of your questions. That was fascinating. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what comes next. And uh, what comes next is a respondent. But it's not necessarily a rebuttal. And our respondent this evening is Paul Wagner. Paul Wagner received his BS in phys physics from Georgetown University and his MS in brain and cognitive sciences at MIT's AI lab. So he knows this subject matter well. He has over 25 years of experience in technology consulting and leadership in data science and AI with both federal agencies and the private sector. In recent years, Mr. Wagner has served as the chief technology officer of a financial tech startup in the Boston area as senior manager of analytics at Accenture Federal Services around DC, and as the president of Beyond Systems in Maryland, delivering intelligent cloud services. He's a busy man, and uh, we're glad he's here to provide some thoughts on Dr. Hertzfeld's presentation. Paul? Thank you, JD. Um, I enjoyed Dr. Her Hertzfeld's uh, presentation and uh, share her uh, curiosity. Uh, like Dr. Hertzfeld, I, I, I anticipate that the ubiquity and the utility of AIs uh, coming soon. Uh, we'll be having a society that's basically infused with AI in many different uh, uh, realms. And I, I additionally think AI can assist us in, uh, assist in caring for us as well. Uh, last night, I got a phone call from a, uh, an elderly uh, friend who received an email about a bogus charge of $1,000 from PayPal. And uh, she called the phone number they gave her and was almost fooled into letting them connect her computer Unfortunately, she resisted uh, and called me to troubleshoot the mischief. Uh, on another occasion, uh, I visited a friend in assisted living and learned that his smartphone no longer worked. He couldn't call anybody uh, due to a billing issue. Uh, after uh, nearly two hours of phone calls with bank, phone company, and others, uh, uh, we were able to resolve it. But I'm often reminded, like then, uh, how it would be nice to have an intelligent digital assistant uh, to monitor and advise in such situations. So my agent would then chat with the others ad nauseum and take care of it and, and, and report back. Um, one other experience uh, I had recently uh, with caregiving, uh, last year my parents, uh, uh, bo uh, both parents uh, passed away. Uh, both needed long-term care for a few months uh, and some folks need it much longer. Uh, my siblings and I stayed with them uh, at their place in Gaithersburg, Maryland uh, daily uh, in the, uh, the final months. Uh, but they also hired professional caregivers, and these caregivers brought some expertise and dignity to my parents, and gave us uh, siblings some relief, some uh, to uh, and some, uh, some yeah some relief and uh, opportunity to focus on our relationships with them, uh, not not necessarily all the mechanics, uh, but not everybody will have such options like kids and professionals uh, in, in the coming in the coming years. So the hope is that one day robots might be able to help around the house uh, with cooking, cleaning some activities of daily living, uh, like uh, the transferring, and trips to Giant and Walgreens. Uh, and you know, a, a little comfort can go a long way, uh, even if the AI is not sophisticated. Teddy bears, terry cloth dolls, pen pals, conversation partners, all of these can foster emotional health and social bonds uh, to some extent. Uh, and even, uh, even avatars can, can bring uh, sustenance uh, you know, some say that God is an anthropomorph anthropomorphic uh, caricature. Empirically, they say God is an avatar of sorts with no skin in the game uh, for millennia. Some say there's no there there. 
Yet for many people, belief in God can be satisfying and even beneficial. So in these early days of AI, uh, while it lacks embodiments, uh, AI might, might bring some well-being, some aid and care, uh, like a long-distance friend uh, and with a two-way uh, interaction. Um, and so now in the field of AI, uh, many, many uh, in AI and in brain cognitive sciences, like at MIT, uh, they embrace a computational theory of the mind. Uh, essentially, view the brain as a machine. So whether it's the brain of a lizard, a chimpanzee, or you know, a human, the brain, in this view, processes inputs and produces outputs in a systematic, predictable way, uh, similar to a computer or other machine. The inputs are sensory information, and the outputs are thoughts, actions, and physiological responses. So in this computational view, the brain's functions, from basic sensory processing to complex thought and emotions, arise from physical processes and interactions within biological hardware. There ain't no spooks, uh, no puppeteers. This is all instantiated in the physical world before us. So therefore, uh, the thought goes, ultimately th these cognitive processes might be re replicated uh, or simulated by artificial, intel artificial means such as AI. Uh, and some researchers uh, envision copying the brain uh, into other machines. This is not not today, obviously, but you know Marvin Minsky, who was named the father of AI, I had one class from him, and uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's director of engineering at Google, uh, they both believe that eventually we'll be able to scan the essential details of the human mind uh, to create an indistinguishable copy in some other machine. Uh, now, if you were to design a brand new brain, you could start with the human genome, uh, which can be compressed down to uh, merely 30 to 50 megabytes, fairly compact, just a design from scratch. And Minsky says that's probably less than is needed to build a 747. Uh, but then, then you'd have to add to that design a lifetime of experience uh, to develop memories and skills and so on. But a shortcut could be to simply copy a brain and then add sensors and actuators uh, with interfaces that replicate the, the originals, maybe extend the neocortex to the cloud. In any case, Minsky says, we can't understand the brain from the bottom up. We, we need to understand how thinking works. So, um, and a see. And Minsky further holds that emotions uh, are uh, are different ways to think for different problem types that exist in the world. Uh, emotions, basic drives, curiosity, and morality are not seen as distinct from intellect, but as strategies for thinking and manifestations of intelligence, which enable adaptation and survival. So intelligence systems tend to take on emotions as, as uh, different modes or as selectors for handling different situations, whether pursuing food, uh, running, from, running from danger, or, or grabbing other opportunities, using the bathroom, different things um, uh, require different motivations to get action and, and uh, enhance survival. Let's see. So uh, when someone, someone does something gladly, that, that feels good. The glad uh, doer finds the activity or its outcome uh, enjoyable and uh, satisfying in some way. So this enjoyment is a positive reinforcement, uh, as psychologists would say, uh, increasing the likelihood that the behavior uh, will be repeated in the future. Uh, machines, too, could experience positive or negative reinforcement for certain behaviors. The question is, do they really feel it? Do lizards and chimpanzees feel it? and have emotions with uh, Jerome Kagan's four stages. So my uh, kickoff question to Dr. Uh, uh, the good doctor would be, uh, uh, do you agree that the brains of lizards, chimpanzees, and humans are machines based on processes of the physical world and autonomous, and autonomous from otherworldly influences such that in principle, a, a brain might one day be replicated? Wow, well, there's a lot in there. Um, and uh, before I answer your question, I want to return to the first two examples you gave of the uh, woman who was being scammed uh, and the gentleman whose smartphone stopped working just to say, okay, here are some of the problems with AI. All right, the first problem is we humans are going to use our tools uh, however, we're going to use them. And being that we are sinful creatures, we're not just going to use them to aid other people. We're going to use them 
uh, to gain power over each other. We, and we're going to use them in many sinful ways. So, um, yeah, we're not always going to use them, unfortunately, to aid the other. And then for the second ge gentleman whose smartphone stopped working, um, yeah, uh, I, I guess I don't really want to be dependent, whether physically or emotionally, on a machine that might very well stop working, whether it's a billing problem or some glitch in the software. Um, I, I laughed at the fact that uh, apropos of your final question, uh, Jaron Lanier, who is the uh, sort of chief guru at Microsoft, um, has said that he's not at all worried about um, you know, there being super intelligence sometime because he, he feels that uh, anybody who knows Microsoft software, you know, knows that these super intelligent robots are going to be begging us to keep rebooting them. Uh, and there might be some truth to that. Now, do I agree with the folks at MIT who think our mind is just a machine and that we could just upload our brains to computers? No, I do not. Uh, I do not for several reasons. The first is purely physical. Uh, even if we are purely physical creatures, there's a whole lot more to us than just the connectome of neurons in our brain. And we have been in the last few years learning so much more about that. Now we know that we have a whole secondary nervous system in our guts. Uh, when people say, trust your gut, or what does your gut say about that? Well, there's actually a whole secondary system in our gut connected by the vagus nerve to our brain. And when our guts are out of kilter, our brains are out of kilter and vice versa. Now, we also even know that the microbiota in our guts can affect our brain. And they're finding that people whose uh, microbiota in their intestines gets way off are much more liable to fall into a depression. So the brain doesn't sit up there behind the blood-brain barrier completely disconnected from the rest of the body. Um, and that doesn't even mention the motor memory that an athlete or a musician has uh, that turns out to be in their, in their hands, in their muscles, in their coordination. So I do think that were we to upload our brains, probably the first thing we'd say when they turned us back online would be, get me out of this box. You know, oh, we are used to being an entire person and the brain is only one piece of something that is all interconnected. Um, and then of course, there is the secondary question. Uh, is there anything about us that is not physical? Um, and this of course is, is the realm of religion and the realm of faith. I cannot prove that there is, um, but I think that uh, in almost all of the world's religions, there has been a belief that um, we, we are more than just mechanics, that there is something to us that we might call the soul or the spirit. Um, from my own background as a Quaker, we talk about the inner light, and that is that of God in every human being. Um, and that is not something that is strictly physical. Okay, um, other questions? Wow, uh, I, I'm loving this. This is really fun. Um, before we get started on questions, I want to invite James Pappas to resubmit his because I'm not able to understand it. And it looks like an important question, but I, I'm not sure what he, they mean. Um, Mark Cooperage uh, starts out by saying wonderful topic and then points out something that may be central to the future of this, this whole industry. He says, OpenAI Corporation removed three board members who insisted on technological assessment over profit, and they were terminated. 
Does this suggest that the profit motive of late stage capitalism itself will override any precautionary tales of this technology? There's money to be made. So he's asking, you know, what, what do you think about how profit and economy will influence this technology going forward? Unfortunately, it's it's likely to influence it in um, somewhat negative directions. Mm. Um, so although I think especially many of us in academia have these, these dreams for wonderful things that AI can do, um, you know, in late capitalism, eventually it's going to be, well, what will the market bear? Uh, one of the things we found with the Internet is that we began with an Internet that connected scientists and, and that the whole point was that, wow, now we can really further human knowledge and uh, interconnect all the scientists globally in, in real time. Um, but what is today's internet basically used for? Pornography, gambling, um, you know, uh, social media, uh, which you could say, well, but at least social media is good. This is connecting people. Um, but then you look at so much of what happens on social media and it's about influencers and the profit motive. Uh, Marketing. Yeah, if, if your Facebook feed isn't full of marketing, it's real different from mine because mine ends up being mostly marketing and I have to dig to find posts from my friends. Um, so, yeah, it's going to end up being about money. And one of the sad things we've seen played out in Silicon Valley over and over again, we saw it when Timnit Gibru, um, who was the ethics guru at Google, was let go the minute she said something that Google thought would harm the bottom line. We saw it with board members who were let go from OpenAI's board as soon as they said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, our mission statement says we're a nonprofit. Um, as soon as it seems to affect the bottom line, all of the ideals for AI go out the window and what we get, I'm afraid, will be the things that will cater to our most basic drives. And what are our most basic drives? Sex, money, and killing each other. <laughs> oh, that is a dismal view, but it's certainly borne out by what we're seeing. Um, Eric Elness says, perhaps we can have an I-it relationship with AI as much as we have with other humans, but it is hard to imagine us having an I-thou relationship with an AI. And asks, could Martin Buber be of help here about relationships and AI? Oh, Martin Buber is definitely of help here, and uh, I quote him extensively in my book. Uh, you can only say so much in 45 minutes, so Buber got left out. But uh, yes, I think he was definitely on to something when he made that distinction between an I-it relationship and an I-thou relationship. And of course, he was saying at the time that it's a mistake when we treat other human beings as if they were things and have an I-it relationship with other human beings. What I'm saying now is that we can make the mirror mistake and when we treat machines, which are its, as if they were thou's, and substitute relationship with them for a relationship with each other, we are, first of all, probably going to be dissatisfied in the long run. Secondly, might be taken in by bad actors. And thirdly, we're missing out on the true I-thou relationships that we can have with each other and with God. Sandra Pang is wondering if elderly people and children who have been assisted by robots, if they're satisfied with the service they get, and, and does it really save money in the long run? Yeah, I, I don't know if it really saves money in the long run. Um, there is some satisfaction to be had. Um, there, the use of, I don't know if you're familiar with these robotic seals called Pero, and they use those with elderly people who uh, have Alzheimer's or, or quite deep into dementia. 
Um, and they found that, you know, just putting the the seal on their lap and, and the seal kind of purrs and it moves and it responds to their touch and that this can be quite calming to them. Um, there have been other studies where more humanoid robots have been used with the elderly. Um, and in, in general, um, satisfaction has been higher than like just giving the elderly an iPad. Uh, but it tends to drop as the novelty of the robot wears off and to come closer to that of the iPad. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems to me that at the beginning, what we often do is project into the AI. We anthropomorphize it in our minds. And then as we see that it really isn't that human-like, you know, the expectations wear off. And I think in a way we're actually seeing that as a society in our reaction to generative AI um, and chatbots like chat GPT and stuff, you know. Um, at first, everybody thought, oh, my God, these are wonderful. And, and oh, my God, these things are going to take over everybody's jobs and, and everything. Um, and I think we're starting to see some of that initial excitement wear off as people are, are starting to say, you know what? It's really not all that useful. And teachers are starting to say, you know what? I can tell when the essay wasn't written by the student. Um, and we get things, uh, I don't know if any of you followed in the last few days, the uh, photograph of uh, Princess Catherine and her children um, that was in the news. And, uh, you know, people were immediately saying, oh, but wait a minute, that sleeve is off. And boy, does that hand look funny. Um, you know, people are looking now at what these programs really can do. And some of that initial excitement is wearing off. Thank you. Grace Wolf Chase says, you've raised a number of thorny issues that also impact how we might think about other humans. What about people devoid of various senses? For example, people with whom you can't look them in the eye or neurological or other conditions that produce sociopathy. She says, it seems there's a slippery slope here that some humans might be considered subhuman using the rubrics that you've presented. Yeah, that, that slippery slope always appears. Um, but the thing is, we can be in deep and fulfilling relationships with those humans. And you might say, well, now, wait a minute, once somebody's maybe in a coma or something, that gets to be difficult. And then I would say, yes, but that person is still in a deep and authentic relationship with God. Um, so I think that the slippery slope is far more slipperier if you take the functional view that the image of God in us is in our ability to be God's hands on earth. Because then you are saying of people who are not very functional or, or are no longer as functional as they once were or are pre-functional like babies that, well, I don't see the image of God there. They're not doing God's work on earth, but they are still in relationships. With, with family, with others, and even if you say, well, what if they have no family with God? Connie Gibbons asks, what about consciousness? Does an AI unit have, <clears throat> excuse me, have consciousness? Isn't that the ultimate difference? And yes. Of course, that begs the question, how, how do you define consciousness? Well, that's a problem. We do not have a definition of consciousness. I think the closest we come is to, to quote the, the senator who once said when he was asked to define pornography, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. You know, um, for a long time, we thought animals didn't have consciousness. I think now uh, our scientific uh, studies have started to show us that no, in many ways, especially our near relatives show that they have much the same consciousness that we do. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I said, my dog certainly seems conscious to me. Um, but there is, there does not seem to be any consciousness um, within, uh, you know, our chatbots. Although some of them talk a pretty good line. I mean, they can talk about consciousness. Uh, I, I got an email just today um, from one of the you know Substack people that I follow in AI who was, had brought together a bunch of little clips about how chatbots are talking about consciousness. Um, the thing is, however, that you know if you ask them directly, well, do you have consciousness? They give a good answer. But if you ask them in other ways, it, it slips. It's it's not uh, it's not consistent. In other words, it comes down to that question of consistency that I raised in my talk. If you are interested in this whole question of AI and consciousness, I would recommend another book that just came out um, just uh, two months ago. It's called Encountering AI, Ethical and Anthropological Issues. And it's issued by a, uh, a panel um, of which, okay, um, I must admit I am a part. Uh, I was one of the editors and one of the writers uh, of this book. Um, and it's, it's coming from the Dicastery of Culture and Education of the Vatican. Um, and you can actually find it online if you just Google the title that I gave you, Encountering AI, and you can download it for free. Um, but the whole first section of the book is a deep dive into this question of consciousness and whether machines can be conscious. Um, most of it written by Jordan Wales, who's just an excellent philosopher. Um, and uh, I would highly recommend that book if if you're interested in pursuing this topic further. Sounds like there's a lot to learn there. Chuck Fowler asks, to the extent that AI is automation of human thought and to the extent that our thinking causes problems, to what extent is AI simply a means of making mistakes faster? <laughs> you got it, Chuck. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I... You probably already noticed I don't have an exceptionally rosy vision of AI. It's not that I don't think it can be an excellent tool in certain circumstances, um, but you know, you're right. Uh, we are sinful creatures. And if we are automating um, our own thought processes or our own tasks, um, you know, as long as those tasks are simple, um, you know, and I'm not saying roaming around Mars is simple, but it's it's delineated, you know. Uh, vacuuming the floor, Roomba, that's pretty simple. Um, Roomba can't get into too much trouble, except that it can really torture the cat. Uh, but other than that, you know, yes, I think we do risk not just amplifying. All tools are amplifiers, and AI is one as well. Not just amplifying the good things that we are able to think or to do, but, but the bad as well. Um, and of course, the um, example of that that I have focused on and will be focusing on again tomorrow is uh, automating weapons to make decisions in warfare and to kill one another. Yeah, I think what you said about um, amplification is true of almost all technologies. Mm -hmm. As long as we haven't got our, our ethics together, Anything that gives us more power and control is going to increase our power and control in all the ways that we exercise them. All right, both the good and the bad. Yeah. Gregory Derry points out, or he shares a story. He says, one of my students once wrote a paper arguing that it is unethical to give robot pets to elderly people with dementia on the grounds that they are being tricked into believing that the pets are genuine. And he asks, what do you think of that premise? You know, th there is something to that premise. Um, I, uh, I do worry that um, people who are mentally impaired, um, whether it's dementia or, or people who have some other mental illness, um, 
are more likely to make the category error of not being able to distinguish between what is truly alive and and what is just a simulacrum. Um, I I do, you know, there's a story that Sherry Turkle tells in in one of her books. Um, and uh, it's about an elderly woman in a nursing home who is given an, an artificially intelligent um, baby doll. It's called My Real Baby. It exists. And, uh, and she is really taken with this doll. And, and she is so taken with the doll and the, the doll having these needs. Um, that when her own granddaughter comes to visit, she ignores her granddaughter in preference for the doll. Um, Turkle says that she feels that um, the patient is, you know, being um, being tricked in a sense um, mm -hmm. and being diminished in a sense. And it isn't only her experience that is being diminished, but clearly the experience of her granddaughter is being diminished as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there are situations in which you can make that argument. And I think any situation in which the AI is used as a substitute um, is, is not a good situation. AI possibly as an addition might be an okay situation. Um, you know, I feel better about the the AI seal than I do about the AI baby because it's in a way I think a little less of a trick and that it's not human. Um, and I would feel better about them being given the seal when they are maybe sitting alone in their room um, and feeling anxious, but I would not feel good about them being given given the seal when they're uh, visiting with family or 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 out in the common room, you know, with other patients. Um, you know that these things um, might have a place, but it it should be a, a circumscribed place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I'm thinking about Moore's law and wondering if how confident you are about your your approach to this <clears throat> if we telescope it out into the the future 10 20 50 years um as as the complexity curve of our especially our computer technologies has been almost exponential um do you think it's possible at some point that AI systems could gain something like consciousness and or embodiment. I mean, if 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 a robot had all the same kind of, of sensors that we have, and if we could simulate emotions and you know the whole shebang, as much as we can can imagine to simulate embodiment as a human, is um you, I know you've sort of already answered that question, but I'm I'm asking you to extend it further out into the future, and and see what see what you think about it. Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing I I will say is um, we give Moore's law a little too much credit. <laughs> uh, even Gordon Moore, you know, the founder of Moore's law, says it's gonna plateau. In fact, it's already plateauing. In other words, yes, um, computer, first of all, Moore's Law deals with hardware, not software. And computer hardware, its capabilities have grown exponentially, mostly because we have been able to make things smaller and smaller. But there's a limit to how small you can get. And we are already seeing a, a sort of a leveling off of the curve of Moore's Law. now. If we actually have some great breakthroughs in quantum computing, we might see that change again. But so far, we haven't seen anything in quantum computing that makes me think that we'll be using quantum computers at scale mm -hmm. in, in the at all near future, if ever. 
Mm -hmm. um, the second part is, of course, software. Our software has not been growing exponentially in its abilities. Yeah, I've um, noticed all the new op operating systems just have more emojis and yeah, exactly. filters and stuff. And they say, well, um, but wait a minute, look at AI. I mean, look at generative AI, large language models, deep learning, all of that. I mean, this has been what has made AI suddenly be in the news in the last year or two. Um, but I believe that even that um, is a bit of a bubble and that that bubble is starting to burst. That uh, people, there were a number of people um, People at MIT in Silicon Valley who, who said, you know, it's it's just a question of scaling it up, but large language models, if we can just scale them up, um, you know, pretty soon we'll be so much more confident, able to do so much more than they can do now. Um, but the fact is that um, that doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, they hallucinate and the hallucinations are not going away. Mm -hmm. um, they're still brutal on the edges. Um, people have said, yes, but at a certain point, they'll be able to train themselves. But this is actually a problem because they thought, well, if they train themselves on what they generate, they'll get smarter. But actually, they, they're getting dumber when they use the things that they themselves generate in their own training models. Hallucinations um, compounded doesn't sound they good. They compound, exactly. The glitches compound. The um, blank spots compound. They don't get filled in. Um, and so, you know, uh, I, I when I project out in the future, I, I'm fairly confident that uh, we're not going to be facing, a, you know, a, a super intelligence uh, in 10 to 15 years, if ever. Well, thank you. Very interesting. No more questions in the, the lineup, but a couple comments. Um, Father John Mary Lugemwa says hi. He, oh, hello, um, Father John. Student of yours from St. John's. Exactly. Uh, a few years back. And um, Mark Cooper says, AI changes the whole notion of build it and they will come. <laughs> yes, it certainly does. Well, thanks to all of you for listening and uh, I hope you have a pleasant evening. Well, thank you for sharing with us your, your wisdom and insights. I'm seeing some clapping hands go up the screen. To close us out, let me say many thanks to our guest presenter, Dr. Noreen Hertzfeld, and also to Paul Wagner for the response and the dialogue. Of course, we're always indebted to CJ Love, our ever present but rarely seen tech host who makes it all work for us. We're grateful also to all of you who registered and attended tonight. 